morning, everyone. Thank you uh, for being here this morning on this uh, rainy uh, Wednesday. Uh, appreciate you being here today. I think we've got uh, some excellent presentations, and I see a lot of our friends from the Virginia Department of Health have joined us today. So thanks uh, for all those with uh, the Virginia Department of Health joining us today. I'm uh, in involved in the General Assembly, and there's a couple of bills on PFAS that are uh, working through the, the system at the General Assembly. One is I would describe as a notification bill uh, related to the drinking water uh, side of it. And then another I would uh, describe as a uh, sampling uh, and notification bill on the wastewater side for industrial and commercial dischargers. And so we'll see how those bills play out through the General Assembly. Unfortunately, I won't be able to stay here for the entire meeting. Uh, Raven Jarvis uh, kindly offered to uh, be back up for me, and I appreciate her uh, when she joins us as well. We have, as I said, we have a couple of great speakers today. Uh, the first one uh, is uh, Kyle Thomas Thompson, excuse me, uh, and he is a uh, PFAS lead and reuse uh, lead technologist at Corolo Engineers. Uh, he has expertise in a number of areas, including PFAS, potable reuse, and machine learning. Kyle received his uh, bachelor's degree in environmental engineering at, from Missouri University of Science and Technology, and he received a Master of Science in Civil Engineering and a PhD in Environmental Engineering from the University of Colorado Boulder. Kyle previously worked as a postdoctoral researcher at the uh, Southern Nevada Water Authority, and he's a professional engineer in Nevada. And so he will be talking about evaluating sources and mitigation strategies for PFAS across the one water spectrum. And then following uh, Kyle's presentation, then we have a presentation from Rebecca Christopher. She's a biologist with uh, the EPA Office of Water, Water Permits Division. Uh, she holds a master's degree uh, in sustainable development and conservation biology from the University of Maryland. And so I look forward to hearing these presentations and I'll turn it back to our hosts and facilitators. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you, Dwayne. Uh, Kyle, would you like to begin sharing your slides? Sure. Okay, so I click share and then do sensor mode. Everybody see that okay? Yes, it looks perfect. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, thanks for the introduction. Should I go ahead and get going? Yes, please. All right. Well, thanks for thanks for joining and thanks for that introduction. So I'm going to talk today. This is a a Water Research Foundation project. It's number. 5082, if that helps you um, look it up on the WERF website, it's um, called Investigation of Alternative Management Strategies to Prevent PFAS from Entering Drinking Water Supplies and Wastewater. So that title's a bit of a bit of a mouthful, but you know, the way I you know, briefly describe this project is, you know, WERF, they were already doing a lot of other uh, projects on PFAS treatment, like um, you know, 4913 was focused on how to treat short chain PFAS. So this this project's kind of about everything but the treatment. So it's more focused on how to prevent PFAS from entering the water in the first place. Uh, so brief brief background. So PFAS, it's short for per and polyfluoral alkyl substances. Um, so there's a couple different uh, definitions out there, but defining it broadly, it's basically any um, organic chemical with, with fluorines. So any, any molecule that has both carbons and fluorines. Um, so images of kind of the two original, most well-known PFAS and, and the center there, I'll, I'll talk more about them in a second. Um, and these, these fluorine bonds, they give the molecules a lot of really really unique and uh, special properties that were useful in a lot of applications. So it's, it's the strongest bond in chemistry, carbon to fluoride. So it makes it very resistant to chemical oxidation or to heat. 
Um, so because of those properties, they're used in things like firefighting foam. Um, and they, they also have a special property where they're, um, it's called oleophobic, where they can be essentially hydrophobic and hydrophilic at the same time, or in other words, repelling both water and oil. So that made them very useful in, in coatings. So they use these as part of the process for making Teflon on pans and also used it in a lot of uh, food contact materials. So microwave popcorn bags and fast food containers. Um, you know, this kind of resistance to water and oil, they used it in, in fabric and, and carpet and clothing. Um, but unfortunately, the same properties that made it so useful in industry are also what caused a lot of the problems with it for the water and wastewater industry. So that, that same carbon, the fluorine, makes it very resistant. You know, that's you know, useful in some ways, but that also means it's very resistant to biodegradation, very resistant to, um, you know, oxidation processes like ozone or um, UVAOP used for water treatment. So the, the two the two PFAS with the most um, sort of evidence, most total evidence for their toxicity, most um, toxicity based on the, the current um, values that have been published by the EPA and, and that have the most sort of uh, imminent regulatory concern are called PFOA and PFOS. Um, so, sorry, this first bolt's a little um, slightly outdated. So, we were expecting a drinking water, a drinking water MCL. Um, the original goal, um, I believe, was last December, um, but that's it's still um, under review with the Office of Money and Budget. So we're expecting that MCL, I believe any any time between now and March, we should see that MCL, which is the enforceable limit for drinking water. Um, which um, and that could be and that could be quite low. So back in back in 2016, there was a health advisory level for these chemicals, which, which is essentially a drinking water guideline, um, which is 70 nanograms per liter of parts per trillion back in back in 2016 and and people kind of assume that that's what the future MCL would be but then in in June of last year um, they announced new health advisory levels for these chemicals that were were much lower um, 0 0.02 and 0 0.004 nanogram per liter for PFOS or PFOA respectively um, so um, that's actually lower than can be measured so they they're not really going to make the the MCLs quite that low since since that can't be can't be enforced because it couldn't be measured that low um that's definitely raised raised the possibility and the and concern that the the MCLs might be lower than 70 which is what people were kind of previously expecting they might so we're kind of anxiously awaiting to find out what those drinking water limits are going to be but Anyway, PFOA and PFOS, so they're they're both eight carbons. So the the O in the acronym is short for octa, like octopus or octagon. So they both have eight carbons, and they're both acids. Uh, both have a, a negative charge, which makes them uh, relatively soluble in water. Uh, the difference is just one is a carboxylic acid, so the and the other is sulfonic acid. So the S in PFOS stands for sulfonic so just a, a minor difference there so pretty pretty similar chemically speaking but again these are these are the two that are uh, you know of most concern regulatorily at the moment but you know PFAS it's a, it's a broad family um, you know there's something like 10,000 registered PFAS but you know really you know you think about it there's infinite ways you can combine carbons and fluorines and other molecules right so 10,000 registered out of infinite possibilities. So we've got this uh, family tree graphic to talk about some of the main categories of PFAS. You can see top center there, there's PFOA and PFOS. Those are the, those are the originals and the, the most well-known. Those are the ones that were um, used in large quantities from the pretty much the 50s through the 2000s. But then when the public became aware of the toxicity of these chemicals the industries they started replacing them with other PFAS so one of the ideas was to replace them with you know these shorter chain PFAS so for example 
For PFOS, you have a, a shorter chain version called PFBS. So it's a you know similar structure, but just four carbons instead of eight. So the idea is that you know this shorter PFAS is you know relatively safe, like a training lightsaber. Um, but then there's lots of other you know possibilities and combinations, right? So you can have um, you can have uh, polyfluoral alkyl substances. So these are ones where they've got some fluorinated carbons, some non-fluorinated carbons. Um, so eight two dipap. The eight means eight fluorinated, and then the two means two non-fluorinated, and then it's dipap because then there's two sides of that. So it's kind of like it's kind of like Darth Maul's double lightsaber, right? Because this can actually the the non-fluorinated part can biodegrade or oxidize in the wastewater. So if the the non-fluorinated part biodegrades in the wastewater, then that double-sided PFAS will actually break down into two Darth Vader style lightsabers. Uh, so you also have this thing called perfluoroethers. So this is um, the most famous uh, example is Gen X. So this is the chemical that they had those issues with in the, the Cape Fear River, North Carolina. So uh, uh, ether, if you, if you ever um, took organic chemistry, means you've got uh, oxygen with carbons on ether side, right? Um, but Gen X, not only is it a perfluoroether, it's also a branched PFAS. So you've got this little carbon off to the side here that's also fluorinated. So that's kind of like Kylo Ren's lightsaber from the from the sequel trilogy, where you've got these like little little side lightsabers coming off the main part. Um, so you know, part of why PFAS are so concerning, you know, not only is there you know a lot of evidence for the toxicity for PFOA and PFOS, the the EPA counted over over thirty animal studies each um, and over 300 epidemiological studies each for PFOA and PFOS um, and some of those studies found some pretty sensitive health endpoints. Um, not only that, but because they were used in large quantities, you know, for, for many decades and were not very regulated because they were proprietary, they had a lot of time to disperse out in the, into the environment at trace levels. So. They've been detected in the ice, even on top of Mount Everest, even at the North Pole. You know, I haven't updated the slide yet with the with a sad penguin, but they've they've even in a study that just come out, they detected it in the ice at the South Pole too. So you're talking trace levels here, but just with cutting edge, you know, university instrumentation, you can you can find trace levels anywhere because it's completely man-made. It's just had a lot of time to disperse out and analytical chemistry is very advanced these days. Uh, so what are the so what are the sources? So as I just mentioned, you know it's measurable at trace levels and precipitation pretty much throughout the entire world. So you know, maybe in the you know, kind of one part per trillion levels and and precipitation everywhere. There's also um, you know detectable. Their PFAS have been detected in every wastewater effluent sample ever measured. Um, you know you know we. Did a literature review over over a hundred samples over a hundred different wastewater facilities. Looked at some of these you know statewide studies from California too. So um, you know any any wastewater effluent is going to have some detectable PFAS, even if there's not an industrial source. It's it's just getting there from you know either either human excrement or maybe leaching off products. Um, but you know, we, it is important to emphasize in the in the messaging that that's you know not the not the wastewater utilities fault right they're just you know passive receivers of what's coming in the influent in influent even even with source control they, there's still some detectable levels uh, landfills so again just from all the household products that have had PFAS over the year disposed in the landfill that lines up in the leachate. Um, there's also you know, a large number of, of PFAS using industries. Hard hard to nail down an, an exact number because you know, just because one carpet factory uses PFAS doesn't mean all carpet factories use PFAS. But you know, arguably it's something in, in the in the thousands of PFAS using industrial sites out there. Um, airports and military fire training areas. So one of the big uses was firefighting foam, specifically firefighting foam for jet fuel. Um, and not only that, but the airports and the and the military personnel they were actually re required for for many years to to practice 
with these firefighting films at regular intervals. So um, unfortunately, some of the most exposed um, individuals are veterans and their family. And then you know, there's also 16 sites in the United States where they would make PFOA or PFOS. And so those are some of the sites where you see the highest levels of contamination, even though there's just 16 of these sites and mostly in the eastern United States. Um, so you know, all that to say, you know, we know the sources of PFAS, but um, there's the motivation for this research project is there's still a lot of gaps in our understanding. Um, um, you know, it's hard to, you know, we know it can move through all these different compartments of the environment. You know, it can, you know, groundwater can, um, dis can discharge to surface water. Surface water can influence the groundwater. You can have PFAS enter surface water from ground, um, from, you know, the wastewater effluent, but you can also sometimes maybe some of that PFAS in the wastewater effluent is getting there from the PFAS that was in the tap water, which is getting there from the PFAS in the surface water. So, you know, all this, you know, movement throughout the, the water cycle and the, and the human ecosystem. Um, so, and then even just because you, you measure PFAS, well, you know, a lot of these PFAS, you know, the same PFAS was used for multiple applications in multiple different types of industry, right? So you can't say, oh, I detected 8-2 DIPAP, so this PFAS must have come from such and such. Like, it's, it's, it's more complicated than that. So, so our goals with this project were to you know, provide actionable um, guidance to utilities on how they could um, track down and mitigate any sources of PFAS to their water. So that included both uh, surface water-based drinking water, groundwater-based drinking water, wastewater. Um, so we started out with some case studies interviewing utilities about their experiences monitoring or trying to mitigate PFAS sources. Then we had various you know, new research uh, studies across the water types, and then it all culminated in a uh, what we call a, a guidebook. So people don't read the manual, so we called it a guidebook on, on how to find and, and mitigate any PFAS sources. Uh, so now the, the case study results, just can I quickly summarize here? Um, so we did, I interviewed about uh, 12 or 13 total total utilities. We've got you know, just the wastewater on, on this table. Um, but you can see from the, the dot plot, you know, a lot of these utilities, they'd, they'd measured PFAS in, in their water. Um, they, they're aware of the, aware of the issue. They're um, thinking, thinking about tracking down the sources. And a lot of times they were on um, sort of groups such as this one, right, where they're, they're on different uh, groups of utilities that, that talk about PFAS or a lot of like these statewide, um, statewide PFAS action groups, or they've participated in studies with where for universities. Um, since with that, the furthest right column there means, but very few, very few had actually done a, a thorough source investigation to then go and, and actually eliminate these sources. Um, so some of the key takeaways from that, um, really a, a key takeaway from that that informed the guidance was the, the importance of collaboration, right? So by, you know, by working with, you know, your state government or with, you know, upstream utilities or, or utilities in the same area, you can really uh, pool your, pool your resources um, to better track down your know, regional PFAS sources. All right, so um, groundwater results, just kind of share some of the highlights. So a lot of what we did with groundwater was honestly more uh, sort of database review than the new research because so much of the, the research on PFAS that existed already was focused on the groundwater. So we, we looked at a lot of the, the databases out there for PFAS occurrence and groundwater-based drinking water or, or sources to groundwater. Um, so here's results from, from two different databases, one by a, um, you know, the state government of Michigan and, and another by a sort of a, a research and ad advocacy consortium. Um, interestingly, in both of these you know, independent databases, landfills was the plurality of the sources to groundwater. Now that, that may be a, a little biased just in the sense that not all of these were, you know, like leachate, right? Some of this was, you know, they intentionally sampled, you know, multiple boreholes near the same landfill. So that may have biased it a little bit, but, um, you know, again, there's, you know, something like 3,000 3, landfills across the country, right? So it's a, a pretty widespread potential PFAS source. 
you know, another thing we did was um, Michigan, and you know, they've they've got a database of um, PFAS sources across their state, but they also did a statewide um, they did a statewide drinking water sampling campaign over over a thousand um, drinking water systems they sampled across the state. Um, and including small systems that weren't um, necessarily included in, in UCMR3. So UCMR3, by the way, that was the study that the EPA did in 2013 to 2015, where they measured six PFAS in uh, all drinking water systems that serve 10,000 or more people, plus uh, a random sample of 500 small systems. So something like, I think 20 something of those just so happened to be in Michigan, um, but at the time, you know, at the time back in 2013, the the methods for detecting PFAS weren't as precise as they are now. So they were about 10 times higher method reporting limits back in 2013 compared to when Michigan did their study in 2018. So they've got the detection frequencies. This is you know percent of uh, samples where you know the PFAS was you know above the method reporting limit. Um, so red is the Michigan study, you know, blue is the, the EPA study, so it's broken down by, by PFAS and by size of the utility. So, you know, higher detection in the Michigan study, and well, I mean, that's what you'd expect, right, if they're using 10 times more precise methods. Um, what was alarming, though, was I then went and filtered that Michigan data based on the method reporting limits that uh, were used in the EPA's UCMR3 study. And so even when, even when uh, using the same method reporting limit, and even when breaking it down by large or small, there was still higher detection in the, the Michigan study. And so that's um, a little alarming because that means either, you know, maybe the, the methods used in 2013 were even less precise than they thought, or, it could mean that maybe there really are more, really were more systems in Michigan with PFAS in 2018 to 2013, maybe because the groundwater plumes continued to spread substantially over the course of that five years. Um, but you know, whatever the reason, this is you know one of uh, a couple cases where, um, so the EPA, they, they're just recently kicking off UCMR5, where they're going to look at uh, look for 29 PFAS nationally um, using these you know new new more precise methods similar to the Michigan study, and they've also they got funding. They're going to go down to uh, systems as small as 300 or 3,333 people instead of 10,000 people. Um, so there there's going to be a lot more PFAS detections in UCMR5 than UCMR3. So it's, it's you know something like a b between one and two percent of systems had um, PFOA or PFOS in in UCMR3, but with these more more precise methods, you know it could be more like you know 10 10 percent, 15 percent, based on this this Michigan study as well as similar statewide surveys done by done by other states. Uh, so moving on to the wastewater. Um, section of the study. So a lot of the, the wastewater results are, are still pending for the project, but one thing I wanted to share, so CDM Smith led the, the wastewater portion of the project, and so they sampled the, um, they sampled various uh, industrial discharges as well, as well as sort of domestic municipal areas within four different uh, you know, we call it sewer sheds or, or collection systems. And what was interesting is that, you know, taking the average across these four systems, and I believe in all four cases individually as well, the domestic wastewater accounted for the majority, um, or at least roughly half of the PFAS mass at the wastewater facility influence. So it's, it's a little uh, uh, squashed here. So this is log axis. So these bars are, are a little further apart than than they look on the log scale, but still there was you know far more. But also on the one hand, this is further apart than they look, but then also that means this is further apart than it looks, right? So there's far more, far more PFAS mass coming from the domestic wastewater than than any of the 
industrial sources uh, across the four, four collection systems sampled. So that really you know, emphasizes, you know, there is this um, sort of domestic base load of PFAS that's coming from you know, either human waste and or leaching off products that you know even you know you can you can implement source control and and bring your PFAS down if you if you do have any significant sources but it's it's still going to be detectable in in your effluent and your bile salts just from that domestic base load. Uh, so oops, got the groundwater in there twice. Um, so moving on to um, surface water. So the the first thing we did in in surface water was we looked at you know the implications of the wastewater. So um, CDM, they had done a, a previous water research foundation project called 5031, where they measured, uh, I believe it was 40 PFAS across 38 different uh, water, uh, water resource reclamation facilities um, across, uh, you know, nationally across numerous, numerous states. And um, so we used the, the data from that previous WERF study to inform the current WERF study. So this is some of the, the data from that. So the, um, these were the four most frequently detected PFAS in, this, in that study. So among them PFOA and PFOS. So um, you, know, you do see some, even though this was you know, fall 2020, you still see some outliers, right? You still, even though you know, PFOA and PFOS yeah, you know, they were phased out by the in, industrial uh, producers of those chemicals by by 2015. But even after 2015, some of the some of the PFAS um, users had stockpiles that they uh, continued to use. So there's been some examples where that's been detected and and stopped, and particularly in Michigan. Um, but then also landfills, right? So landfills are going to continue to have PFAS in their in their leachate even after these these phase outs, right? Um, so you know we're some outliers in the distribution and in, indicating you know likely some kind of ongoing point source. But you know, just on on average, it's around eight nanogram per liter PFOA and a median of four nanogram per liter PFOS. Uh, so what does that what does that mean? For any any drinking water systems downstream, well, um, so this this chart's a, a little complicated, uh, so I'll, I'll take a minute to explain. So the the x-axis is the percentile of PFOA concentration in wastewater effluent. So 50% that means median, and then 100 would be the uh, the highest in the in the set that were sampled, and then the lowest would be zero. And then on the y-axis here, this is the percent of de facto reuse. So the percent of that surface water that's made up by that um, wastewater effluent discharge. So the, you know, I guess, alarming news. So, you know, eight, eight parts per trillion uh, PFOA, it would only take one two thousandth of that to exceed the EPA's 2022 health advisory level of 0 0.004 nanogram per liter. So really virtually virtually any wastewater effluent and surface water would exceed that guideline even without any major industrial source. Uh, the, the good news, so each of these lines represents a enforceable state standard. So the strictest uh, enforceable state standard for, for PFOA is in Michigan at eight parts per trillion. So it you know, just so happens the strictest state standard is roughly equal to the con average concentration in wastewater effluent. So it would take uh, you know complete 100% de facto reuse, you know, and slightly above average you know, concentration before you'd exceed that that Michigan enforceable standard. So, um, so now I'm going to talk. How am I? How am I doing for time? Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about two um, surface water source investigations. So we we looked at three different um, three different um, watersheds and as part of this project. So one of those is the Huron River in Michigan, um, but there's there's been a lot that's been done and said on that previously. So I'm going to talk about the the two others. Uh, so the first of those 
is what's called the Las Vegas Wash. So the Las Vegas Wash is the, the river that essentially conveys the wastewater effluent from Las Vegas back to Lake Mead. So Lake Mead is the largest uh, drinking, largest reservoir in North America when full. Um, it's you know kind of the 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 keystone of the whole Colorado River system. So um, around 40 million people, you know, pretty much the you know vast majority of people who live in um, Nevada, Arizona, or the southern half of California are you know, dependent on on this river um, for either 40 million people rely on this river for their their drinking water and or the water that they use to irrigate crops at their place of work um, and uh, this is a, a very stressed water system so it's it's um, last I checked around 25 percent full um, it, it was, you know, the last time it was all the way full was in 1983. Last time it was nearly full was 2000. Uh, back, back when I worked, I worked at Southern Nevada Water Authority from you know, 2018 to 2021. Uh, around that time, it was, you know, it was around 40% full for, for that whole three years. But then as soon as I left, I checked the news and it dropped all the way to 25% all of a sudden. So it's um, an, an alarming state right now, even with the, the recent precipitation. Um, so the Las Vegas wash, it carries, it's um, around 90% uh, wastewater from the Las Vegas area. Um, and this is actually sort of a, an, an intentional system where with the, the interstate negotiations, uh, Nevada, um, so Nevada only gets about 2% of the, the water rights to the Colorado River. Um, but they've negotiated with the other states that they get to pull out more water in proportion to what they 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 put back in. So they they call it re return flow credits. It's um, you know they they don't call it that, but it's essentially an indirect potable reuse system. Um, and it it also in the event you know on the extremely rare occasion that there is any rain in Las Vegas, the the stormwater from the Las Vegas area enters Lake Mead through this wash as well. And then there's also um, the groundwater portion is, is very um, relatively high in, in conductivity and in, in certain elements like selenium. So this is this is a very uh, very well studied, very well studied river system. Lots lots of studies by Southern Nevada Water Authority and others measuring measuring contaminants and things in this river. So actually all the way all the way back in 2009, Southern Nevada Water Authority back before back before most people were even within the research community, we're aware of PFAS. They, they you know, you know kind of original gangsters, so to speak. They measured PFAS in 2009 in this in the system. Um, but then another another group measured measured PFAS in, in that in the in the Las Vegas wash and published that study in 2021. Um, and so comparing that 2009 to uh, 2021 studies is the PFOA. Was about the same, but the PFHXA is one of these these short chain PFAS much higher, in the in the more recent, in the more recent study. Um, not only that, but you know, there's been a, a large amount of PFAS data. I believe over 30 total sample size collected at the largest of the wastewater facilities that discharge to the Las Vegas Wash. So there's there's four. Wastewater facilities that discharge the Las Vegas wash and, and the largest of these partners very frequently with Southern Nevada Water Authority on, on you know, scientific studies on potable reuse. So a large PFAS sample size, very well characterized. Um, there's actually less, less PFAS um, coming out of that wastewater facility than what was measured in the wash in, in either of those studies. So that you know, raise the question of you know, where is this? Where is this other PFAS coming from? So, you know, we looked at looked at the map, right? So here's a kind of rough outline of the system. So in the the darker blue, you've got the main stem of the Las Vegas Wash. Some of the tributaries shown in the light blue. Um, so there is an Air Force base. Uh, there's an Air Force base up by one of these um, tributaries. There, there's two airports, a, a big one and a, and a little one. 
Um, you know, not a lot of not a lot of uh, hard industry that goes in and on in Las Vegas. So you you may have heard, but you know, it's a tourism tourism based economy out there. You know, um, not entirely. They've you know, made efforts to diversify, but not a lot of hard industry. There is, however, um, there is, however, a, a factory up in the north of town that makes uh, paper products, including things like popcorn bins, like you might use at the theater, um, which is you know, a type of product that you know, has been known to, in some cases, contain PFAS. So those are some of the hypothesized PFAS sources. Um, so we sampled the Las Vegas wash over uh, three different campaigns to get you know, robust, robust sample size. So um, and we know the flow at a lot, there's a lot of USGS gauges, um, throughout the, the wash and its tributaries. So that, which is great, because then we can, if by taking samples where these gauges were, we could multiply the flow by the concentration and actually get a mass or a, a mass rate of the PFAS and then actually do a mass balance. So it's not just, oh, look, there's, you know, detectable PFAS, but actually what's contributing what percentage of the PFAS to this wash by converting it from a concentration to a mass. Right, so, um, so these are some of the, so these are the numbers and, and the bold there. So they, these are the PFOA, these PFOA concentrations measured at the four wastewater treatment facilities. And then these numbers are some of the PFOA concentrations measured and the tributaries, so is one of these tributaries, the Rawhide Channel near the major airport, you know, 320 nanograms per liter PFOA, so much larger PFOA near the airport than on these other, other tributaries. Um, so meanwhile, the Air Force Base, so the, the tributary that runs by the Air Force Base is actually dry most of the time. Um, and it's dry from from where the from where the Air Force Base is to where there starts to be uh, consistent water in this channel is about two miles. So really, for it to even be plausible that the Air Force Base would be contributing PFAS to the river under under you know average dry conditions, it, to get there it would have, it would have had to have gone through the groundwater um, for over two miles before re-emerging into the into the tributary and that's even though it's something like 500 700 feet down um, from the from the surface to the water table in that region um, but we did sample groundwater uh, just to you know triple check that wasn't the case um, so you see here this is this is a picture about two miles down where there starts to actually be water in that channel um, this is this is a picture of that uh, of the of the paper factory, so they've got they've got tanks of something, tanks of some kind of chemical over there. But again, very just a minor trickle, very minor trickle of water um, in that tributary during dry weather, and there weren't any visible discharge pipes from that factory to that channel. And this is a, a picture of where the uh, another channel was sampled going from the small the small airport. So. Not, not a lot of PFAS nor water in the channel from the small airport to the main channel of the system. And then this is a, a picture of where the sample sample is collected. So you know, very, very low trickle. So wasn't a, wasn't a, a USGS gauge on this little trickle of water. We actually, um, for some of these low flow channels, we use what's called a float method, where you measure the cross-sectional area and then uh, time a floating object and then multiply the area by the velocity to get a flow. Um, so again, because we had flows either from USGS gauges or using a float method, we could multiply those by concentrations uh, to, get a, to get a mass and then divide the mass upstream by the mass downstream to get a percent contribution. Um, you know, part of what made this complicated is you know, it's, you know, it's a large system you know, over you know, the course of a, your entire metro area. It's very hard to, you know, precisely time the Santa collection with the theoretical plug of water, especially when you're talking about multiple tributaries. But we did actually, at least for the for the flow data, we we lagged the the time based on how long it would take from water to get from point A to point B before selecting the flow data point. 
um, because you know there's you know big uh, daily patterns in the flow for the wastewater, and then again the the river is 90% wastewater effluent, so there's you know a pretty massive you know times to swing in the flow and the and the wash over the course of a day as well. So here's what that um, here's what that mass balance results look like. So we've got total total measured PFAS over on the furthest right here. Uh, so pretty good pretty good mass balance. Um, when you're looking at total measured, so you know, very little unaccounted on average for the total measured. Um, so the two of the main tributaries are in the are in the hash here, and then the the wastewater facilities are in the the solid solid block bars. Uh, so you know, it, it did appear that the majority of the PFAS was entering. Uh, via the wastewater treatment facilities, again, not you know passive receivers, not their not their you know fault or liability, but that's that's how it was entering the system. And then you know interesting, so wastewater treatment plant three, that was the one with highest flow. Um, that was the one with highest flow, and it actually had the the lowest concentration among the four wastewater facilities, but because it had the highest flow, it came out to be the highest mass. Um, you know, had the had the highest mass for the majority of of these PFAS, particularly the sulfonic acids, um, because of that higher flow. So a um, couple things to point out. Um, so these are the carboxylic acids. Uh, these are the the sulfonic acids over here. So carboxylic acids they can often be um, breakdown products of polyfluorinated substances. So it kind of makes sense that they'd be in wastewater excuse me, wastewater effluent from domestic sources, because you, know, you, know, you might have like a polyfluorinated substance in, in your clothing, but then over the course of you know, the, the, that breaking down over time or breaking down in the wastewater, that kind of turns into a carboxylic acid. But it's sulfonic acids that have historically been used for the, the firefighting foam. So wastewater treatment plant three, it actually was the one that um, drains the area of the of the major airports, so interestingly, you see uh, proportionally higher higher sulfonic acids in the in the wastewater facility draining the airport. Um, and you'll also notice a pattern. You'll see so the stashed line at 100%. That's um, represents a perfect matchup between what was measured downstream and the main stem wash and the sum of the masses measured upstream. So you know some of these. Um, you have long chains like PFDA, um, so the D stands for 10 deca, you know, 10 carbons or PFOS, there's higher measured upstream. And then for others like the, the PFHXA, PFHPEA, there was less measured upstream than downstream. Um, so we did a correlation. So did a correlation between um, how the concentration measured upstream uh, exceeded or, or was beneath the concentration downstream, and then log D. So log D is uh, a measure of the hydrophobicity of the PFAS, which is also highly correlated in, in turn with the chain length or the number of carbons in the PFAS. There's a pretty strong correlation between how the mass balance exceeded or was under the expectation and the hydrophobicity of the PFAS. So what that means is that the hydrophobic long chain PFAS like PFDA and PFOS, these were likely sorbing to the sediments. Because um, some of these tributaries, some of these are, are concrete lined, but some of these, especially the more upstream tributaries are unlined, right? So it's like exposed to, to soil. Um, so it appears these long chains were sorbing to the sediment or the walls of the channel and not reaching the downstream downstream reaches, or at least not reaching them yet. And this has been this has been documented in um, several other PFAS surface water studies. Um, so it's pretty pretty important because here's a, a zoom in on the area around the airport. So we collected groundwater samples. So one groundwater sample right right on the on the airport. So you'll see hundreds, hundreds of nanogram per liter, PFHXS, PFOS, um, also relatively elevated, relatively elevated concentrations of these you know, sulfonic acids at a, at a site uh, near to the near to the airport and near the, the channel. 
Um, so it does look like sulfonic, sulfonic PFAS were, were coming from the airport from those you know, firefighting practice activities and getting to the channel where you know, there was uh, hundreds nanogram per liter of these sulfonic acids. But then as you go downstream, um, so for one thing, there's you know, less than a percent relative flow, very little flow in this channel relative to you know, Duck Creek or the, or the main stem of the Las Vegas wash. Um, so you, know, you look at the Duck Creek upstream of where the Rawhide Channel joins and then downstream of where the Rawhide Channel joins. So you know, the PFBS goes up, so that's the shortest chain of these of these sulfonic PFAS, but the PFOS, it actually went down. It went down as you're going through the Duck Creek, even though it got joined by this tributary that had hundreds of, of parts per trillion. So you know, we did the math and, and then even lower by the time it gets to the Las Vegas wash. So we, we know this compound is, is non-biodegradable um, and even, even accounting for the dilution, we would have expected more PFOS to result and the Las Vegas wash than, than what was measured up here in, in the Rawhide Channel. So it appears that it's uh, just sort of sorbing to sediment along the way before it reaches the main stem. Um, all right, so surface water study number two. So this, this surface water study was on the Trinity River in Texas. This is a, a much larger system compared to the Las Vegas Wash. This is basically the, the river that flows from the Dallas area down to the Houston area. So there's a, a 185 wastewater facilities in this, in this watershed compared to the, the four and the Las Vegas Wash. So we frankly did not have the, the budget to go and, and measure all 185 wastewater facilities. Uh, so for this, we, we took a, a bit of a different approach so we sampled 10 sites in, in the first campaign and uh, 12 surface water sites in the second campaign. But then alongside the PFAS, we also measured uh, a chemical you may have heard of called sucralose. So sucralose is um, a, basically the most uh, popular artificial sweetener in uh, diet sodas. And it's it's thought to be very much non-toxic. So it's, it's a very scary looking chemical when you when you look at its molecular structure, lots of uh, chlorines in there, but you know, study after study, it's, you know, I'll put, I'll put it this way, it's legal in Europe, right? So, you know, Europe tends to be a little more proactive with, with banning chemicals um, than the United States, but, you know, even, you know, Canada, Europe, everybody agrees this artificial sweetener, non-toxic. So very, very different story um, to the toxicity research on PFOA or PFOS. Um, but what it has in common with PFAS is that it is extremely persistent. So it has, the, and you know, instead of fluorines, it has some chlorines, and and that gives it that same strong bonds that make it very resistant. So it, it you know passes, um, you know, entirely through biological treatment. You know, only you know, and very m minor removal and oxidative processes. So it's um, very persistent in, in wastewater treatment and the environment. And also it's um, a very high concentrations. So, you know, you tend to get, you know, single digit PFAS and wastewater effluent, right? Single digit for PFOA and PFOS anyway, um, tends to be tens of thousands of nanogram per liter sucralose and wastewater effluent. And we actually did a, a bit of a meta-analysis. Um, so it's actually going, it's going up and wastewater effluent over time. So it used to be you'd get, you know, 10, 20,000 nanogram per liter. Nowadays you get 50, 70, 80, even 100, 1,000 nanogram per liter of sucralose and wastewater effluent. So um, this appears to be um, diet sodas all rebranded themselves as zero sugar. And, and people would much rather drink a zero sugar soda than a diet soda because um, zero sugar, that sounds healthy. Diet, that sounds, you know, uh, like suffering, right? So there's been an increased popularity in diet soda, which has uh, resulted in growing concentrations of sucralose and wastewater effluent. And also because this is coming from people drinking diet soda, it's pretty consistent from one wastewater facility to another, so as opposed to coming from you know, a major industrial source. You know, maybe that would be different if we sampled you know, the Coke headquarters in Atlanta. So the idea was um, this, um, well, uh, it'll, it'll be pretty clear on a future slide. 
So here's the here's the PFAS profile as you go downstream. So site one is upstream, site ten is downstream. This is uh, color color coded by different specific PFAS, and this uh, y-axis is the sum of the sum of the detected PFAS. So you'll you'll see a, a pretty large increase in in PFAS as there's um, you know, growing discharges through the the major urban area and so peaks in the sort of middle middle reaches of the river before going back down with more dilution as you get to the rainier rainier wetter areas as you get closer to the the gulf coast so what we found was a very high correlation so r squared 0.92 between uh pfas the sum of the measured pfas and the sucralose um and then also our um Arizona State, who was the partner on this project, who who led this pr particular task, um, they they have um, hydrogeological models for the de facto reuse throughout the United States. So they did you know, this three-way comparisons between the PFAS, sucralose, and the the modeled de facto reuse, and so extremely extremely high correlations between uh, the sucralose, the PFAS, and the modeled de facto reuse. Interestingly, actually stronger stronger correlations between the PFAS and the sucralose than the PFAS and the model de facto reuse, which, which could indicate that sucralose is actually a better indicator of the real de facto reuse than the model, because the model doesn't necessarily take into account the, um, it just includes the uh, capacity of the wastewater facilities. It doesn't take into account those you know, daily fluctuations. Um, so all that to say, uh, you know, similar to the Las Vegas wash, um, but kind of using a different analysis approach, it looks like for this river too, um, the majority of the PFAS would have been entering through the wastewater wastewater facilities. Um, though again, you know, the you know the wastewater facilities are passive receivers, you know, should not be held you know, liable at fault for that PFAS. Interesting, we we didn't sample all hundred and hundred and eighty-five of those wastewater facilities, but we did measure measure two of them and, and one of them had um, much higher, much higher PFAS than the other. So it did appear that there, there is um, somewhere in that watershed there is an industrial source that that or or point source to the two-way collection system, which may then be reaching the, the facility. Um, so all that all that study was was done to inform the the guidance document. Um, so we laid it out. We organized the chapters by chronological steps in the process. So it's a, a seven-step process. Um, he wrote a, a little summary article, um, jo uh, jokingly named it the seven habits of highly effective PFAS source trackers. Um, and so this this guidebook, so it's not yet online for Water Research Foundation. It's it's uh, draft, fully drafted, but you know, undergoing the, the project advisory committee review. So not quite online yet, but you know, happily share a preliminary copy with, with anyone who's interested. Um, Couple, couple interesting tidbits from this. So one of the things we did was we reviewed the, the analytical methods that are available for PFAS. Um, so it's kind of this trade-off where you've, on one hand, you've got LCMS. So this is um, liquid chromatography mass spectrometry. So that's the technology that's used to measure specific PFAS down to you know, parts per trillion levels. Um, but the trade-off there is you know, you're only detecting you know, the you know, 20, 30 PFAS that you've got standards for in the method, uh, you know, you wouldn't be detecting any of the other, you know, 10,000 potential PFAS that may be present. On the other, the other end of the spectrum, you've got uh, total organic fluorine, um, which is more, uh, more uh, specifically called uh, or adsorbable organic fluorine, because you, you never know for sure that you're really getting the whole total. It's just what you manage to um, absorb or, or pre-concentrate in the first step of the method, but there's these um, organofluorine methods that you know strive uh, to capture all fluorinated organic chemicals, um, and you result in much higher numbers. But then the trade-off here is well, maybe you're you're capturing this wide range of potential fluorinated chemicals, but you're not you don't know which one it is that's there. So you just get this single number of one or two parts per billion total fluorinated organic chemicals, and you don't really know 
what that means. And then you have um, top assay, which is uh, uh, oxidizes the polyfluoroalkyl alkyl substances into measurable perfluoroalkyl alkyl substances. And so it's kind of like a compromise between the LCMS and the total organic fluorine. Um, we also, we developed a screening tool. Um, so we, we looked at uh, that data that had been collected from the prior uh, WERF 5031, WERF 5031 study and uh, did a statistical exercise where we iteratively removed the higher outliers till what was left was essentially a, a normal distribution. And so you can think of it like a box and whisker plots. We left out the, the dots that represent the outliers until what was left was just the whisker, right? So anything, anything higher than the maximum non-outlier would be an outlier and, and likely um, industrial impacted. So for this set of uh, specific PFAS, anything above this level likely has an industrial source. And so we did this based on both you know, literature data and and the new data collected for that previous study, and pretty pretty similar results. So you have uh, for fluoropentanoic acid, for example, 44 versus versus 47. So similar result there. So anything higher than you know 44 to 47, very likely industrially impacted. I don't have it on the slide, but we did the same for biosolids too. Uh, so with that. Um, I'd like to acknowledge it's a big project with, with a lot of team members. So uh, Carolla was the, the PI on this project, but our, our co-PIs included Hampton Road Sanitation District, CDM Smith, Purdue, Arizona State, and Southern Nevada Water Authority. Um, our, uh, we also had on our, our technical advisors, Megan Plumley from Orange County, Ron Hoffman from University of Toronto, and, and Christopher Higgins from Colorado School of Mines. Um, a lot of people involved on this project from those different partner agencies in particular. It's a very long list of names for Southern Nevada Water Authority. So they did the, the chemical analysis for, for both of the watershed studies as well as the, the physical going out there and sampling for the Las Vegas wash study. So a lot of, a lot of people involved on that team. So with that, I, I think I um, only left about five minutes for questions, but I'll, I'll answer as many, many as I can. Thank you, Kyle. You actually left about 10 minutes for questions, so yeah. we really appreciate it. Um, excellent job. The first question is actually already in the chat. I will read it in case you don't see it. Um, this is from Tony Singh at the Virginia Department of Health. Kyle, great presentation. Really enjoyed. How many PFAS on the x-axis did you include in the sucralose graph showing an R-squared of 0.92? Um, so, so we get, so that was the sum of the, some of the detected PFAS, and then um, these are the ones that were detected. So it would have been 25 that were measured for, and so just go on, let me, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Um, so 11 total were detected in at least one sample. Some of those, like the 6.2 FTS, and I think the PFBA on here, oh, we left off PFBA because it was only, only detected in one or two samples. So I think 12 were total were detected, but um, in any sample, in any given sample, that could have been anywhere from 12 to maybe just, what is that, like seven or eight? So yes, this is, yes, this is the sum of between seven and 12 specific PFAS. So it's not specifically PFOA, PFOS, and it's certainly not total organic fluorine. Great, thanks. If anyone else has questions, you can feel free to unmute yourself or add them to the chat. And while we wait to see if anyone else has any, um, you may have mentioned this, if so, I apologize. When will the guidebook be available for work subscribers? Uh, sometime, sometime 2023. So uh, we've got it, you know, 90, 95% written. And 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 we've we've shared shared what we have with work, but um you know the you know it needs to go through pack review and and then you know there's there's a while for the the document processing, um so so hope hopefully sometime 2023. Great. Other questions? Okay. 
Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time this morning and, and sharing this. How long has it been? How many years has this project been happening? Uh, so this kicked off. Um, so I actually started, um, worked on, contributed to the proposal while I was working at SNWA and then had the fortune to continue working on the same project when I made the, made the move over to Corolla. So um, I think it would have kicked off um, May, 2021. So yeah, it's been, you know, almost, been almost, almost two years. years. Great. Thanks again. Um, so with that, uh, we can move on to Rebecca's presentation. Oh, wait, let's see. There's another chat comment. EPA is working on MCLs for PFOA and PFAS. However, these materials are banned. What other PFAS, PFAS, all alcohol substances, uh, currently in use be investigated for PMCLs? I guess that's primary MCLs. I'm not sure if Robert Edelman, if you want to clarify if I read that correctly. Okay. Do you do you have an answer, Kyle? <laughs> um, well, I mean that that may be a better question for the um, for the next speaker, but uh, I would say um, so. Two other uh, PFAS, so Gen X and PFBS, have also been given health advisory levels. So if if there were to be more PFAS to get MCLs, those would you know probably be the next two soonest. Um, that does depend also, you know, at least in um, you know, the, the protocol is, you know, part of the justification for an MCL is, you know, the toxicity, but also it's like, you know, if the, if it's not detected anywhere, why bother, right? So at least going based on the, the UCMR3 results, um, I believe it was um, in the range of zero to two systems that had PFBS above the, its health advisory level, um, so that they may or may not put a, put an MCL on that one just because nobody's, you know, it doesn't look like there's very many people above that safe level. Um, but so that those would be, but at least in terms of the, how far along they are in the risk assessment process, Gen X or PFBS would be the next in the pipeline. There's a few others, uh, like I believe PF, HXA and, and PFBA that have been given a, a, a reference dose or, or have, which is the kind of the toxicity value that then informs the health advisory level that then informs the MCL. Um, so a few others that have uh, been given reference doses or or that in the strategic roadmap, they said that they're going to you know assess the toxicity of. Um, and then beyond that, you know, it's, you know, we're, we're talking harder, the further you get into the future, the harder it is to predict, right? But, you know, I did see um, recently there was this uh, re recent announcement from the EPA that there's one particular PFAS uh, let's see if I can pull up that press release. Um, so there's a new a new PFAS called Huffpo trifluorotrimethyloxyrane that's still in in very large scale use in industry. So they ordered the industries to do more um, toxicity assessment on that chemical. So think think um you know there's a lot of a lot of push from the you know 3m announced they were planning to get out of the pfas business entirely a, a lot of push from you know, e esg investors to see other chem other companies do the same you know on the other hand you know there's you know there's a lot of you know viable uses for p you know they use pfas for um you know medical devices like you know catheters and artificial hearts right and I, you know i think you, you want your artificial heart to have a the highest poss highest quality possible non-stick surface right um so you know, maybe maybe you know what we, we we hope for as a society that they only use these chemicals where it's truly necessary maybe not that they get rid of it completely but um yeah i think there will be i think as as a topic this isn't going away i think for for some time there's going to continue to be new new pfas that emerge and then have their toxicity studied and then have their occurrence studied I hope that answers the question. Hey, Kyle, um, uh, this is Tony Singh again, since we have a couple of more minutes. So uh, uh, I, I wanted to ask you a question on Gen X. Uh, in uh, most of your presentation, um, you know, you, you did a, a wide variety of literature survey using different, uh, uh, you know, 
uh, data sets and different sources. So did, did you see any instances of Gen X detection or did you not look at that particular uh, chemical, I mean, in wastewater or biosolids? Because uh, uh, there are many places, many industrial places that is charged to these wastewater uh, systems uh, nationwide. So did you pick any uh, such instances of Gen X detection or? Yeah, so, so, Gen X, so Gen X, it's, it's on um, SNWA's PFAS method list, right? So they did not detect PFAS, or they did not detect Gen X in Trinity River. They did not detect Gen X in the, um, they did not detect Gen X in the, in the Las Vegas wash. Um, for, for CDM, for their 5031 study, I believe they did not detect any Gen X across um, 38 facilities, wastewater facilities nationwide. Um, for the uh, California, California statewide study out of um, 200, uh, almost 200 facilities, I think they got one hit for Gen X, just like a, a couple single digit part per trillion in San Diego. And I think I forget, it was either they found it in the influent, but not the effluent, or vice versa. Um, I th yeah, I think it was the influent, but not the effluent, but not the influent. And, but that's because the method reporting limits are are lower. It, it was detected in the effluent at a level that was lower than the method reporting limit in the influent. Um, so, so just like a little tra one little trace level hit in San Diego. So yeah, outside of outside of North Carolina, there just doesn't seem to be a lot of Gen X nationwide. Thank you. So that would suggest to me if there's not a lot of occurrence that that may not be a priority in terms of developing an MCL. Yeah, I mean, we'll see, right? We'll see what happens when, because, you know, they'll measure for it in UCMR5. So, I mean, I, I will say, I know the environmental working group, they sampled tap water from something like 40 different cities. I think they found like just a little bit in New Orleans and just a little bit somewhere on the Ohio River um, near the West Virginia PFAS factory. So, I mean, maybe maybe there will be a few non-North Carolina hits or maybe they'll find it in enough places in North Carolina that you know it's, they say, all right, well, this is one more than 1% of the nation, then that justifies the MCL, right? So, so we'll see, but yeah, I think um, cause yeah, I think, you know, frankly, I think these companies, they, they have gotten more careful about their releases to the environment and also, you know, GenX, it's, it's, you know, it's used for the making the Teflon, but when you, once you make the Teflon, it's, it, it becomes sort of like merged with the, the polymer, right? Um, so it doesn't necessarily break down back off of the Teflon, or if it does, maybe it's now in the form of a different molecule. Um, so it, it doesn't appear to be leaching off. You know, maybe they've been using it. Well, and also they've only been using it for a couple of years compared to these, you know, PFA, PFX using it for decades, right? So even if it does leach off of products, it hasn't had the hasn't had the time to leach and break and disperse the way that PFOA and PFOS has. So, so we'll we'll see, but yeah. Great. Well, we have one more minute, so we're going to throw one last question at you. Um, that's in the chat. To what extent is the PFOA or other carboxylic acids detected due to the degradation of other PFAS? Right. So, um, so one of the things, so that that literature review, we I mentioned one of the one of the things we learned from that. Um, so comparing influent and effluent at the same facilities, there was an average increase of six nanogram per liter. <laughs> Um, from the influent to the effluent, and then you take also the into account. There's an average of eight, so it could be the ma could be the majority. You know, something like seventy five percent of that PFOA and the effluent may have formed uh, from polyfluorinated chemicals over the course of the of the facility. Great, thanks again. We appreciate your time this morning. Um, Rebecca, do you have your slides ready to share? I do. Let me just, um, sorry, I never actually used WebEx before. So let me just hit share. Um, all right, can you all see that? Yes, no, it's not in presentation mode. But yeah, we can now see I'm that. trying to put, start the, <laughs> <okay>. <laughs> there we go. There you go. And, um, 
I'll just mention for those who joined late, Dwayne did introduce Rebecca early on. But Rebecca is with the Office of Water Water Permits Division at EPA, and she's going to give us this update on the NIPTES permitting process for PFAS. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm Rebecca. I'm with uh, US EPA headquarters, Office of Water. Um, I think normally um, my colleague in Region 3, Ryan Schuart, would be here today, but um, I'm filling in for him. So happy to be here um, to talk about EPA's uh, strategy on PFAS, primarily our NPDES permitting uh, strategy. So just to start with a little bit of background, um, since taking off since the Biden administration took office in 2021, um, they've the administrator Regan has made very clear that PFAS is an agency priority that we're going to tackle it from sort of all all angles, all authorities. Um, in April 2021, um, he started the PFAS Council, and then in October of that year. Uh, they released the PFAS strategic roadmap. So that's basically, you can go um, epa.gov slash PFAS and take a look at it, but everything I'm gonna talk about um, today is straight from there. It is our agency-wide strategy um, to address PFAS um, from all different statutes. Um, I'm obviously gonna talk about the water uh, components of it today. Um, so, the previous speaker, we talked a little bit about the drinking water MCLs. I'm not a drinking water person, so <laughs> I'm not the person to really answer any of those questions, but that was very much a big feature of our roadmap. Um, but as far as the Clean Water Act commitments in it, um, uh, the roadmap committed us to developing technology-based PFAS limits, um, which are effluent guidelines uh, for industrial dischargers, revising any ELGs or effluent guidelines um, for technology-based limits for uh, PFAS, um, developing new analytical methods, uh, publishing water quality criteria, um, biosolids, and the thing I'm going to talk about mostly today um, address PFAS and Clean Water Act permitting. So just to give, before I get into that in detail, just to give a little bit of background on some of those other things, um, you all may have seen very recently, like within the last week or two, our Effluent Guidelines Program released um, the final ELG Plan 15, which announced a few new uh, rulemakings and studies to address uh, PFAS, the main one being an update to our effluent guideline for landfills. Um, we're going to be doing a new rulemaking on landfill discharges, uh, including promulgating for the first time um, pretreatment standards for landfills. Right now, they only have uh, that uh, guideline only contains limits for direct discharges and PDS discharges, but this uh, revision is going to look at uh, landfill discharges to publicly owned treatment works or uh, indirect discharges. Um, they're also um, announcing a couple new studies, um, uh, a POTW influence study, um, expanding the study on textile mills, uh, and they're um, a sort of revision or continuation of the studies on airports and pulp and paper manufacturing, which are two industries that have committed to phasing out the use of PFAS uh, nationwide. And so just continuing sort of a small ongoing sampling um, of those industries to kind of make sure that that's going on. Um, and this is in addition to ones we've previously announced um, metal finishing, OCPSF, which is organic chemicals, plastics, and synthetic fibers, which are the PFAS manufacturers. Those are already underway and still on schedule for um, 2024. Um, and then some non-PFAS related things, CAFOs, steam electric, ELG, um, those are still ongoing as well. Uh, water quality criteria. Um, April of last year, we proposed the first uh, aquatic life criteria for PFOA and PFOS. 
Um, those were proposed and the comment period closed in July. And as I understand it, they are still reviewing those comments and will publish the final criteria uh, later this year. Uh, and analytical methods, um, we published the draft uh, method 1633, uh, and that is still ongoing. It has now been um, multi lab validated for wastewater and is single lab validate. They're working on the multi lab validation for other matrices. Um, you can see it's posted to our website. They um, also have draft method 1621, which is an AOF adsorbable organic fluorine method. Um, so that's still moving along as well. And then just wanted to mention as well, um, the emerging contaminant funding that um, was appropriated through the bipartisan infrastructure law. Um, there's several billion dollars that Congress appropriated to address emerging contaminants specifically that's being distributed um, through clean water SRF programs. So um, that money is there for states to use to work on all of this. So to get into um, the NPDES component of this, um, the roadmap, as I mentioned, included specific commitments uh, to leverage NPDES permitting uh, to reduce PFAS discharges to waterways. Um, PFAS was something that the public is very concerned about. There's a lot of attention on it, and it didn't seem the administration really did not want to um, just say, well, we don't have criteria, we don't have the ELGs yet. Um, they wanted to know what we could do now. Um, understanding that writing permits for emerging contaminants is very complex when you don't have criteria or uh, T bells. And you don't even have an approved method, um, but they wanted us to issue a guidance that talked about, well, what can we do now? Knowing that the problem is very pervasive and there's a lot of public interest in this. So in December, we issued the uh, memo. Um, this was the third version of this memo. Um, the roadmap actually had us issuing two, one, um, that was just for federally issued permits, the other targeted at the states. But when we issued this one in December, it replaces all of the previous versions of this um, for one holistic policy guidance uh, for permitting uh, PFAS discharges. Um, as I mentioned, the tools permit writers usually use to um, write permits, ELGs, criteria, uh, they're still in development, so this memo describes steps that permit writers can take uh, to address PFAS and permits right now. So, memo itself is written very much in like legalese, uh, a very dense, lots of legal citations. So, this slide here is kind of my um, my summarizing in my own words visually here sort of conceptually how I think about it. Um, so uh, it's broken into sections for one for industrial direct discharges and one for POTWs. Um, so to start just with direct industrial discharges, um, you know, I like to think of it sort of as this overarching strategy that starts with um, identifying the sources in your state um, starting to do monitoring to kind of validate where those are, um, figure out what the magnitude and the concentration of PFAS is coming from those facilities uh, and identify as well sort of where those PFAS uh, detections interface most uh, directly with public health concerns um, like downstream uh, drinking water intakes, if there's communities with EJ concerns, um, figure, you know, all of that out or map all of that out um, and then use that information to develop a plan uh, to address that. Um, so, again, just starting with our recommendations for uh, NPDES di uh, direct discharges, um, there's a list of the industries that we've typically found um, 
this is from out of our roadmap, um, but we've typically found these to be the ones primarily that you would find PFAS in their wastewater discharges. It's not all encompassing. We've heard a few other people mention, well, what about CWT, uh, centralized waste treatment? So there could be others, um, but this is just a starting point um, that's by no means exhaustive. Uh, begin to monitor those facilities. Um, we recommend using method 1633 as that is the most reliable. Um, and 1622, the AOF method can be used uh, for screening in conjunction with that. Uh, and when you're able to establish where that PFAS is coming from, where it's potentially causing problems, um, the memo contains recommendations on what permit conditions can be implemented right now while we're waiting for these final um, regulations to uh, be issued. Um, the memo, of course, contains a long comprehensive list. Not everything in the memo is going to be appropriate for every facility and every permit in every state. Um, not every state is going to be able to accomplish them in the time that it will even take to <laughs> issue PFAS uh, criteria and T-bills um, in 2024. Um, but, you know, we wanted to just make the message clear that we think at least conceptually these uh, these tools are available. Um, some of the some of the things we've seen successfully applied in places like Michigan, uh, it, it's really a lot of BMPs such as product elimination, um, product substitution, where there's another alternative um, numeric end of pipe limits using GAC treatment. Um, and then of course, ensuring any downstream stakeholders, um, drinking water utilities, tribes, or you know communities that might have certain economic or traditional reliance on fisheries in that uh, region are more proactively notified um, in the permitting process. So for POTWs, the concept is pretty much the same, just understanding that POTWs, obviously they have their own NPDES end of pipe permit, but they also have all of the industries discharging into them. Um, but it's the same similar idea, establish your universe, uh, develop a plan to monitor and sample to figure out where the PFAS is coming from and in what concentrations and then implement some of the tools at your disposal. Um, the first thing we recommend is conducting an IU inventory. Um, now, if you're a POTW operating a pretreatment program, um, you probably already have an IU inventory, but one thing that uh, we're finding is a lot of those industrial users may have not be represented on it because of um, they're either small volume dischargers or they are not categorical. They, they don't have an effluent guideline, um, landfills being the big example there. Uh, maybe they're received through a, a waste hauler. So a lot of these, uh, and so where our recommendation includes uh, conducting a PFAS specific IU inventory uh, to get a picture of what's in your collection system. Um, and then similar to NPDES permits, um, you'll want to develop a sampling plan um, to kind of investigate more closely the presence of PFAS and where it's coming from. Our guidance recommends Influent, affluent, and biosolids monitoring uh, and monitoring of the IUs in your PFAS inventory. Uh, again, using method 1633 in conjunction um, with 1621. Um, you'll also want to, uh, where possible, develop a sampling plan that kind of helps you differentiate uh, or selects points in your collection system to kind of help differentiate what might be domestic contributions uh, compared to industrial contributions. As the previous speaker mentioned, we do find um, a, a significant amount of PFAS introduced to a POTW is coming from domestic uh, dischargers. And so to the extent your sampling plan can reflect that and select points in your collection system to help uh, illuminate that, um, that would be helpful uh, to the POTW. Uh, and then also, you know, 
similar to MPDS permittees, identifying any downstream drinking water utilities, uh, your sludge disposal goals will help prioritize what solutions are needed uh, or that can have the most impact. Um, and again, our recommendations are including the full array of mechanisms, knowing that not everything is going to work in every uh, city at every POTW. Um, not every city will have the authority to do everything. Um, but what some of what we've seen, um, you know, again, from states like Michigan that are really far along on this is uh, a focus on uh, product elimination, uh, particularly for metal finishers, the chrome platers that are using PFAS for um, fume suppressant, um, switching to a different technology for that. Um, We've also heard uh, legacy contamination can continue to get detections uh, even after they stop using PFAS. So some of those DMPs might include um, pro or equipment replacement or decontamination just to eliminate that source. Um, so for completing your inventory um, or you know identifying facilities that this strategy might apply to uh, we pulled this list from the proposed circular hazardous substance rulemaking uh, it contained this kind of helpful list of NAICS codes uh, so some of our regions have been using these NAICS codes to do uh, in inventory of their cities to figure out uh, which sources they may be receiving from uh, in their collection system. So again, this is in the, this is just copied straight out of the circle rule making uh, the proposal. So I thought it was helpful. Um, the other, uh, another big question I get is on the analytical methods uh, and whether you have to use 1633 um, I get this question every time. So the answer right now is no. Uh, it has not been incorporated into 40 CFR Part 136, and there are no Part 136 methods for analyzing PFAS. Um, so that means when there are no uh, 136 methods, the there are regulations in the MPDS and pretreatment regulations uh, at 122 and 403 on uh, sort of what method to choose and that, you know, the director and the permit facility can select any suitable method. Um, and so, you know, our recommendation is that the most suitable method is 1633. It is multi-lab validated for wastewater at this point. Um, and it is the most reliable standardized method. Um, we do get a lot of questions on whether they can use the quote modified drinking water method uh, and what that means. And uh, again, there's no regulation stopping you from doing that. Um, but what all that basically means is that the lab is using um, sort of a non standard in house method that they're basing off of 537, which as I understand from our chemist, 537 specifically says they cannot be modified. So they're just basically making their own uh, in-house uh, method. And um, so if you choose to go that route, there is some risk in that. Um, anecdotally, what I heard before 1633 was published in draft is a lot of variation in the reliability of um, anything called it a modified drinking water uh, method. So you'd want to make sure if you're a permitting director issuing a permit, you'd want to make sure you review that laboratory's SOP and the performance data of whatever method they're using. Um, or you can just use 1633. Um, we have an FAQ, the link at the bottom that describes everything I've just said. Um, but that is a question we get a lot. Uh, and they also get asked, well, what BMPs um, should be used. And again, this is still information that we're still studying our, uh, and still information that we're collecting. We don't have a lot of national level data, but what we hear from states and cities that are already doing this is again, the product elimination um, for firefighting, um, making sure at airports or any stormwater permits um, with firefighting activity, um, that AFFF is used only in emergency situations and not for training. Um, 
again, cleaning, decontamination, and uh, replacement of equipment just to address any legacy contamination of facilities that used it historically, and good housekeeping and spill prevention practices. So that's it. Um, any questions? Thank you, Rebecca. Are there any questions? Feel free to take yourself off mute and ask. Hey, Rebecca, this is Greg Prevalent with Fairfax Water. I have a question. Uh, thank you for a great presentation. That was very helpful. Um, my question is, um, you, you mentioned the landfill work, uh, looking at landfills. Um, do you know if uh, EPA under the, uh, let's say landfills or other surplus sites, whether there's any uh, efforts under the PFAS strategic plan to look at um, CERCLA sites that may have been um, characterized prior to PFAS being an issue or PFAS tech, you know, monitoring being available and, and looking at whether that those could be potentially a concern from, from CERCLA sites? Um, I don't know. CERCLA is a different office and I don't know for certain. Um, I think our, you know, on the wastewater side, you know, what we have authority to look at are, you know, the wastewater discharges to waters of the U.S. Uh, and POTWs. And um, so they have a number of PFAS studies and that goes by industry by industry. Uh, and circle sites, it would depend whether those are included in that depends on if they are sort of categorized as that industry, if that makes sense. Um, but I don't have an answer on the on the circular side on that. I'm sorry to be more helpful. Uh, there's a question in the chat. Is there any evidence that AFFF was used at sites outside airports, for example, at city or county firefighting training facilities? Um, I. Do you think that um, when you're looking at like stormwater permits uh, or like legacy contamination, um, airports, military bases, um, firefighting training facilities are all places where uh, anywhere where a triple F um, might have been used? Uh, I even heard of one site that was just like a factory where there was a giant fire and they were getting detect like years ago and they were getting detections and there was, I, I don't know if they ever figured out what that was from, but at the time there was speculation that it could have been just from that one fire years ago. So I, I would recommend if you're permitting, uh, doing a stormwater permit for a site that you would consider any kind of historic firefighting activity there. Anyone else have questions for Rebecca before we move on? Okay, well, thank you for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> I